Hey everyone, I thought I'd take you through the creation of one of my gardens from start to finish to, to give you a feel for what's involved. Landscaping a client's garden has so many facets to it, especially when you're starting from scratch. When you're creating a garden for someone else, you have to put yourself in the shoes of your client and look at their specific needs and their requests, find out what their likes and dislikes are, and sometimes even try to anticipate things they haven't even thought of. It's very much an exercise in trust. The client has to trust you and rely on your insight and perspective and knowledge to be able to give them what very often they didn't even know they wanted until they're sitting in it at the end. The gardens I build are as much about relationships as they are about the spaces that, that, that we create. The client in this case was someone that I, I felt a connection with and, and where the trust was there from the start. They're a large family with, with young children and so they needed space for the children to play. They love their food and the idea of growing their own food and fruit. The pool was also really important and needed to connect to the house. And, and because they entertain a lot, they needed a place where they could gather around a table outside. Their privacy was also very important to them. And at the end of the day, they wanted the garden to be low maintenance so that they could spend most of their time enjoying the garden rather than, than working on it. The property is situated in a, a very upmarket development in a very established neighborhood. And because theirs is a, is a ground floor unit, it has apartments that look down on it from above and, and neighbors that look into it on at least two sides. The apartment and garden is north facing, so it gets great light, especially the afternoon light is incredible. And being in Durban with our year round great weather, the garden would be used a lot. Taking all these factors into account, I wanted to create a garden that was completely connected to the home. It should feel like you're just walking into another room, albeit outside. To achieve this, all the levels needed to be adjusted to make sure that inside and outside are, are really all one level. Initially, my client was talking about paving around the pool, but that felt too hard a surface, especially with young kids around. And so we eventually settled on hardwood decking to enclose the pool and to create an entertainment space that's an ideal transition to the garden. To further emphasize the outside room feel, we built a, a beautiful big pergola with six meter span trusses to enclose the entertainment area and to give it an intimate feel. An automated awning was installed so that the space can still be used even when it's raining outside. For the main garden, I chose a formal style for two main reasons. The, the first was to maximize the size of the lawn so that children could run around and play with the ball. And also a formal style would fit well with the contemporary feel of the apartment. The side garden would be the kitchen garden area, which would also double as a sheltered spot that in winter would be a, a great place to sit and warm up in the afternoon sun. I continued the decking feel, but framed these squares of decking in the same edging that we used to define the garden beds. These were also laid out in a relatively random pattern to almost feel like stepping stones around the side of the apartment. The kitchen garden would have a, a mix of fruit, herbs and veggies along with some flowering plants. The first thing that went into the garden were these giant pock ironwood trees or keonanthes so that we could create that feeling of enclosure and privacy as quickly as possible. And now really one year on they're almost completely closed up. The next step was the preparation of the deck area. We, we had to remove quite a bit of soil, which was tricky taking all the soil out through the beautifully tiled apartment. We also laid pipes across all the areas where cabling or piping may need to be laid in the future, because really there's nothing worse than finding that you need to rerun some electrical or water pipes and, and then have to lift paving or decking to do it. For the cost of just a couple 110 mil pipes, you might as well think ahead. We also laid our irrigation pipes at this stage. This is where it helps to have a landscape plan and an irrigation layout in advance to make sure you know exactly where everything is going so that you're not having to undo anything at a later stage. My client had some reservations about hardwood decking because he felt that they, they don't last, but as I said to him, decks don't last because builders take shortcuts. And there are just a, a really a couple of things that need to be done to make sure that they last. The first is, the fact that moisture is a killer, especially in our humid Durban environment, leave a decent airspace between the deck and the ground to allow for, for airflow, and that prevents rot. Put a, a permeable weed barrier down and lay stone on top, 
and this prevents water from pooling and, and weeds from growing. The second is to use properly treated wood. You want to use H4 treated wood for any wood that's in contact with the ground. H6 is the highest and, and that's used for any wood that's sitting in water uh, because the treatment prevents rot. H3 is used for exterior wood that's above ground and this is resistant to termites and other insects and decay. So, so all my posts were H4 treated pine and all the joists were H3. The third thing to bear in mind is that you need to make sure that all your screws are stainless steel. I can't tell you how often I see decks failing because the supplier has used anything other than stainless steel. The cost of stainless steel is usually about five times the price, but it's invaluable when you work out the cost of repairs or installing a new deck. The final step is making sure that you keep up maintenance, doing regular checks on the deck to make sure you have no problems. I, I personally love the natural weathered gray look to, to established decks, but in this case, my client wanted to keep the, the rich, deep color of fresh wood. Never varnish a wooden deck that's exposed to the elements. The varnish will crack and discolor, and then you end up having to sand the entire deck, which is, it's a huge and unnecessary job. I recommend a product called Timberlife, which is a blend of oils, resin, and wax, along with a UV stabilizer. It also contains insecticidal and fungicidal additives to prevent rot and insect damage. The benefit of using this is that the wood absorbs the oils and eventually the gaps between treatments increases and you hardly ever have to put it on. I planned the layout of the deck in SketchUp beforehand to make sure that the design would work well. We laid out and concreted the posts in place, attached the joists and then began putting the deck boards down. We used Masaranduba because it's slightly harder than Balao which is our other option and it gives a nice deep rich red color. Next we needed to start putting up our post for the pergola. The concrete base is reinforced for extra strength. I had these post bases made from steel and then galvanized them to make sure that they wouldn't rust. Because of the scale of the pergola and the weight of the trusses, I used these beautiful big 140 millimeter posts as support. I just love these. Once the deck was laid, we laid the charcoal cobblestone edging throughout. One of the best things about using an edging of some kind is that it really defines the garden. Regardless of how things are looking in the beds, if your edging is done beautifully, the garden always looks neat and tidy. It also doubles as a mowing strip and keeps the grass from spreading into the beds. Also from a maintenance point of view, garden beds tend to get bigger or smaller as the edges get trimmed over time. Edging helps prevent this from happening. One of the items on the wish list was a play area and we discussed building a jungle gym with a slide which morphed into a small treehouse. But the small treehouse grew and grew over time because we realized with all the kids and cousins and friends who might visit something small just really wouldn't do. A sand pit was a must. Kids of all ages love sand pits. As much as this was an integral part of the design, I, I didn't want it to be too prominent. It needed to blend into the background somehow. A pretty tall order when you consider that it was the size of a small house in the end. I designed it so that it had only one post, which I tried to make look like the base of a tree itself, with supports growing out at, at sort of natural angles. I wanted it to feel like a real treehouse, even though the trees themselves were all still relatively young and unable to take the weight of the treehouse itself. To make it as unobtrusive as possible, we had to really tuck the treehouse into the corner of the property, which meant that we had to build it around the trees, further making it feel like a real treehouse. We built windows, a door, a small front deck, a slide, and a climbing net. We even built a secret entrance in the back corner to keep any pesky adults out. The pergola was the next step and the scale of it was daunting considering the span of the trusses and the requirements of the awning company. The runners need to be perfectly in line to make sure that the awning opens and closes smoothly. The tricky part of the pergola were the two ends. We were left with two odd angles that the awning couldn't cover and, and we wanted to keep the feeling of privacy and enclosure from overhead but still allow light through. So instead of leaving two permanent sails overhead we ran angled pieces of timber at the ideal angle which would maintain privacy but also maximize light into the apartment. 
have to say this may have been the trickiest part of the whole build just getting these angles right but in the end it was worth it I, I just love the way the light comes in at different parts of the day and and these shadows on the wall Next, the lawn. We use Dactylactinium australe or, or Berea shade grass because it's a lovely soft grass that will grow well even in the shade with a bit of traffic. And with the shade created by these giant pock ironwoods, most grasses would really struggle to grow towards the back. We also built in some additional drainage points into the lawn to make sure that there was no chance of water overflowing anywhere. And finally, the planting. I wanted to create a low maintenance garden that would look good all year round and, and suit the client's modern taste. So a formal style garden made the most sense. Initially we talked about placing three huge big feature urns in the back garden as a focal point from the house, but instead we kept it simple opting to take these out of the design. The planting for this bed would be simple with three layers, a neat viburnum hedge at the back, agapanthus and some other seasonal flowering perennials in front and then right in front, a neat box hedge. This box hedge would run all the way around the garden to define the garden and, and give it a feeling of year-round continuity. A quick note on hedging, I see many people making the mistake of being too impatient and planting the fastest growing hedge they can find. And, and this is obviously great in the short term because you have an almost instantaneous hedge, but very quickly you realize that you've created a monster. An all too common hedging plant that's used exactly like this is Giranta, Sheena's Gold. Most people are very surprised to find out that these are not little plants, but each plant is just a baby tree that, if left, would grow to about 20 meters high. Because they're trying to get to that height and are such fast growing plants, they need an incredible amount of maintenance to keep them looking neat. Buxus is a great plant that's perfectly suited to being kept as a small hedge. Its small leaves and slow growth means that it keeps its shape well with little extra work. On the sides of this main garden, because we had a bit more light, I wanted to add some colour, which we did in the form of Salvia lucantha, Gora and Pentus lanceolata. All of them stay quite small and give year-round colour, and, and they also bring a certain degree of wildness into the garden, which I think balances the monotony of a typical formal garden. And even now, in the middle of winter, I mean, they look spectacular. As I mentioned, the kitchen garden needed to be productive and still look good. We added all the usual herbs and veggies like lettuce, parsley, thyme, spinach, lemongrass, oregano, dunya or coriander, chilies, peppers, lavender, brinjals, borage and basil. But we also had some bigger things like a fig, curry leaf tree, lemon, mulberry, guava and this granadilla to grow on the trellis. We also planted some flowering plants in here too, like salvia, to link to the main garden, pansies, status and snapdragons. This space doubles as a space to sit in the afternoon as well as there being an outdoor shower to rinse off the pool water. So not only is it a functional, productive space, it'll also look beautiful too. So one year on, I think the garden has grown into all that I'd hoped. The, the main thing is that the client loves the space and spends a lot of time outside and the children especially spend so much time in the garden playing and enjoying being outdoors rather than spending all their time on devices and i feel that not only are we growing a beautiful garden but we're cultivating friendships we're encouraging a love for nature and an appreciation for god's beautiful creation and if this garden is a real success the children will end up being gardeners themselves so I hope you enjoyed this slightly longer video. If you did, please like and subscribe. Feel free to leave a comment or a question below. Otherwise, happy gardening.